Dear students, dear studentess, I know it's Monday, we're all groggy. Psychology is the last thing on our mind, but life has to go on. Today's lecture is a unit in objects relations theory, and so your reading assignment is Balint, B A L I N T, Otto Rank, Spitz. Bowelby, Guntrip, Winnicott, and Ferber. The ego evolves. There is a big debate whether when the baby is born, the baby has an ego, or whether the baby develops an ego, evolves an ego, as he grows up. It's a big debate. Freud says one thing, Melanie Klein says another. The very concept of ego is very contentious and derided, actually, by modern psychology and modern psychiatry. It's no longer used in respectable circles and in universities, especially in the West, where there's an emphasis on experimentation, laboratories, white coats, and pretensions to science. The ego evolves, it is molded, it is jump-started via external object relations. The baby forms a, the ego, develops it, begins to get in touch with it, senses it emerging only when the baby interacts with other people. Now, of course, the first person is mommy, she is the primary object. The mother is the first to provide the baby with a sense of externality. There's something out there. Initially, the baby is immersed in this oceanic feeling. Uh, we are the world. <laughs> he cannot make a distinction between himself and objects out there. And mommy is the first uh, who provides him with this external internal dichotomy which gives rise to the ego. As life progresses, within the formative years, especially by, by the critical age of two, the baby had encountered other people, had accepted and realized that these people are not within himself, they're not part of himself, they're not extensions of himself, but they're autonomous, independent entities with agency. And this is a trauma, of course, but he overcomes it, and an ego is born, or an ego evolves. The ego derives strength and a sense of reality from these interactions with external objects. Of course, if the interactions are fraught with fear, with dread, with terror, with unpredictability, with absence, with rejection, with humiliation, with violence or aggression, with negative emotionality and affectivity, if the external objects do not provide the baby, later the toddler, with what he needs emotionally, love, unconditional love, acceptance, warmth, receptivity, predictability, structure, order, justice, if the external objects are arbitrary, capricious, narcissistic, selfish, absent, dead mothers in Andre Green's term. If the external objects frustrate the child much more than they gratify the child, the child has a problem with his or her ego. It's not evolved. It remains stunted, stilted. It remains primitive. It remains fragmented. It does not integrate. Such a baby grows up, becomes an adolescent, and then an adult without an ego. And we call these kind of people narcissists or schizoids. One of the strategies that such a baby develops is a fear reaction, a flight reaction. It's very frightening, it's very threatening to be in touch with a non-responsive parent with a parent 
who refuses to allow the child to emerge and become an individual, to separate, to set boundaries, a parent who parentifies the child, a parent who objectifies the child and uses the child for a variety of, of reasons, instrumentalizes the child, or a parent who abuses the child classically, sexually, beats up the child, starves the child, etc. Such a parent is an infinitely ominous figure. The child's dependence on the parent is total and absolute. The child cannot survive without the parent. And a bad parent is essentially a death verdict. Now, healthy children who are born, luckily for them, to healthy parents, they seek pleasure. There is a pleasure in interacting with the parental figures and later with role models, peers, etc., by extension. There's a pleasure in interacting with external objects. And Freud called it the pleasure principle. Now, the pleasure principle later is regulated via the reality principle, which its seat is in the ego. The ego embodies the reality principle and controls the pleasure principle, which is the id. But such children would be pleasure-seeking. Children who are born to dysfunctional, threatening, bad parents, such children will prefer safety to pleasure. They have a flight reaction. And what's the only way open to them to be safe? Not being. They want to undo their being. They want to not be. They want to become absent. They want to become a void in emptiness because a mother can abuse a child who is there a child who is present a child who is with her a mother can never ab ab abuse an absence an emptiness a void deep space how do how do you abuse a non-being a non-entity you can't so by undoing one's being by becoming an absence, one actually defends against the fear, defends against the abuse, the mistreatment, the dread, and the terror and horror of being at the mercy of a, of a hater, being at the mercy of someone, at the total mercy of someone who doesn't love you. So absence, emptiness, ironically, ego death, they are very common among narcissists and schizoids. Because they are common among both narcissists and schizoids, there's been a god-awful confusion at the very beginning between the two. And in the 60s, narcissism was considered a schizoid manifestation, a subtype of schizoid phenomena or schizoid disorders. But narcissism is not a schizoid phenomenon. It's not um, a schizoid disorder. It's intimately connected with a schizoid disorder, intimately connected with a schizoid style, schizoid phenomena, phenomena schizoid lack of emotions, or lack of access to emotions, schizoid absence, schizoid withdrawal and avoidance. They are all su supremely intimately connected with narcissism. They are twins, but they are not identical twins. Narcissism is an attempt to avoid the schizoid solution. Now, to remind you, the baby is tormented, tortured, horrified, terrorized by bad parents, absent parents, selfish parents, abusive parents. And he feels that his life is in danger. It's a life-threatening situation. So he chooses to undo his own birth. He chooses to go back to the womb. He wants to go back to the womb. He wants to say, okay, I don't like this world. I don't like mommy. I don't like anyone here. They don't love me. They don't give me what I need. I'm terrified. I feel very frightened. I want to stop the world. I want to get off. 
I want to go back to mommy's tummy. I want to disappear. I want to go back to the womb. That's a schizoid solution. I don't want to have emotions. I don't want to have relationships. I don't want to acknowledge the existence of external objects. If they do exist, I feel threatened. I feel suffocated. I feel, I feel like they can kill me. I feel like dying. I don't want anything to do with other people. And I don't want anything to do with my internal world as well. Both of them out. So this is the schizoid solution. Narcissism is an attempt to maintain object relations in the face of the schizoid solution. It's an attempt to avoid the schizoid solution. Because as you see, the schizoid solution is mental suicide. And no one wants to die, really. So narcissism is, is a kind of middle-of-the-way uh, home, kind of a compromise. We'll come to it in a minute, and we'll come to your role in this compromise, your critical role as the narcissist's intimate partner. And why the narcissist insists on having an intimate partner? is without an intimate partner, he cannot implement the narcissistic compromise. So the narcissist is a child or an adolescent or an adult who feels threatened by the schizoid solution. Because the schizoid solution is psychological suicide, is cutting yourself off from the world, is having nothing to do with people, is not experiencing any kind of emotion, is the undead, it's the living dead. It's to zombify yourself, mummify yourself. So, narcissism is an attempt to avoid this. And how does the narcissist avoid the schizoid solution? Via grandiose fantasies of invulnerability, omnipotence, and omniscience. Let me explain the logical sequence. The baby says, I'm terrified. I'm terrorized. I feel my life is in danger. My parents, my mother, is a dead mother. She's a bad mother. She hates me. She does or she doesn't love me. She doesn't hold me. She doesn't contain me. She doesn't support me. She doesn't allow me to separate or individuate. She objectifies me, instrumentalizes me, parentifies me. Horrible. I can't live like that anymore. It hurts. It hurts a lot. This abuse hurts a lot. So I'm going to pretend that I am not vulnerable, that I cannot feel pain, that I'm omnipotent like God, that I'm omniscient like God. I'm going to pretend that I'm God. And you know, you cannot hurt God. And you cannot intrude on God. And you cannot force God to do anything. And you cannot, you cannot abuse God. So the narcissist, narcissistic child or the child in the process of becoming a narcissist converts himself into a divinity, a godlike figure. It is a solution, because if you are godlike, if you're a divinity, if you're an Olympian god, you're untouchable, you're invulnerable, and you experience no pain, no hurt, and no abuse. Problem solved. So there are two solutions now. One is to go back to the womb, to unborn yourself. To unborn yourself, to become the undead, to become zombie, a zombie. The second solution is to be born again. So, to become another entity. You were born as a vulnerable, fragile, small child, totally dependent and in need of these parental figures who had let you down and frustrated you. So now you will be born again. This time, the, as the exact opposite of this child, you will be born as godlike, omnipotent, omniscient, invulnerable, etc., etc. You will be reborn as a god. It's a metamorphosis, like Kafka's metamorphosis. But this time you're not born as a cockroach, you're born, reborn as a god. So, um, being reborn as a god is a solution, or being unborn. And becoming undead is the solution, is another solution. And one solution is fighting the other. Narcissism is an attempt to suppress the schizoid solution, to somehow remain alive, to somehow remain in touch with reality, to somehow have ex uh, relationships with external objects, however thwarted, 
deformed and dysfunctional these relationships are, they are better than nothing. They are better than the schizoid solution, where there are zero, no relationships. And this self-concocted, self-invented invulnerability, omnipotence, omniscience, the locus of this is the false self. The false self is a construct. But the false self, ironically again, paradoxically even, represents a compromise. It's a compromise. The child says to himself, I'm being abused, I'm being maltreated, I'm being mistreated, I'm being, I'm being ignored, I'm being instrumentalized, I'm being, I mean, I'm, I really feel bad, I, I'm really hurting. The pain is unbearable, intolerable, I'm overwhelmed. I have emotional dysregulation. Right. So, how to solve this? Um, I don't want to die. I don't want to become a schizoid. I don't want to cut off from the world. I want to have contact with people. I want to go out. I want to experience some emotions. I want to see flowers. I want to see sunshine. I don't want to die. I don't want to go back to the womb. I know it's a solution. I know it's a perfect solution. If I absent myself, if I convert myself into an emptiness, a void, it's a solution. Because no one can abuse, torture, and torment a void, or an emptiness, or an absence. So, schizoid solution is very efficacious, self-efficacious. But, I don't want that, the child says. I still want to be. I still want to have a modicum of life. 10% life, 20% life. I want to stay alive as much as I can under the circumstances. So the false self is a compromise because the false self allows allows the, the child who had become a narcissist to maintain external object relations. But the external object relations are not with the person, not with the narcissist. The external object relations are with the false self. The external object relations are maintained but they are one step removed and they are they take place with a decoy with a facade with a construct with a piece of fiction the false self so anything bad that happens in external object relations anything bad that happens in an intimate partnership in a business transaction with friends anything bad that recreates the experience with the rejecting parental figures is not happening to the narcissist. It's happening to the false self. The false self kind of attracts the fire. That's why I call it a decoy. So the narcissist discarded the schizoid solution. The narcissist says, I'm not going to become a schizoid. I'm not going to withdraw from the world. I am going to have relations with other people, external object relations. I'm going to experience emotions of some kind. I'm going to reach out to the world somehow. But because I'm terrified, because I'm traumatized, because I've been abused, because I can't tolerate this pain should it happen again, I will not survive. What I'm going to do, I'm going to invent a piece of fiction. I'm going to invent a Wizard of Oz. I'm going to invent an artificial creation. And I'm going to tell people, please interact with that thing with this entity, with this self, not with me. Don't interact with me, because if you interact with me directly, you will cause me pain. You will cause me pain that I will not survive. Mortification. This is known as mortification. I don't want to be mortified. It's life-threatening. I want you to interact with, the, with my false self. I had created the false self for you to interact with. Please, love the false self. Admire the false self, adulate the false self, serve the false self, do everything with the false self, leave me alone. Leave me alone because I'm fragile, I'm vulnerable, I can die, I don't have an immune system, I, I am immunocompromised, I cannot protect myself against the virus of love, this love is pain. So please, direct all this energy at the false self. He can take it, it can take it. And so the false self is actually a combination, a compromise, because there is a facade, there is a firewall 
there is an outward public facing kind of visage, mirage, fantasy that maintains object relations, maintains touch with reality, however distorted, and behind this facade, behind this mirage, behind this stage set, there is a schizoid inner absence. The narcissist's combination, internal schizoid state, external object relations, one step removed. External object relations are maintained in narcissism, but not with the narcissist. They are maintained with a work of art, with his creative effort, known as the false self. And behind the false self, what the false self is shielding is a schizoid inner absence. It's an egoless state. It's exactly like being unborn. Where a real core should have been, there's nothing. Howling winds, empty corridors. It's a, an abandoned castle. An abandoned castle. And the fortifications of the false self. The enemy is going to attack the fortifications. The castle is secure. So the narcissism is a combination. Schizoid state plus functional object relations. Functional for the narcissist. Dysfunctional for other people. And in a way, narcissism as a fantasy defense fetishizes you, converts the intimate partner into a fetish. The fetishistic part, coupled with the narcissistic fantasy mediated via the false self, they provide a fantasy defense against the schizoid state, which is essentially death while alive being buried alive, be, becoming undead, becoming zombie. We will discuss this, the fetishistic element in the solution, a bit later. When the narcissistic solution fails as well, you remember the narcissist rejects the schizoid solution, adopts the narcissistic solution, which is a compromise. Okay, I will become a schizoid, but I will maintain object relations via a false self. <clears throat> when this solution fails, there's mortification, and then the narcissist becomes 100% schizoid. He withdraws, he avoids, he vanishes, he absents himself from himself. He, he experiences firsthand what it is to not be. It's not a feeling of safety, because for the narcissist, the schizoid state is threatening. For the classic, for the classic schizoid, the schizoid state is safe. It's not egosyntonic. The classic schizoid resents his schizoid incapacity, his schizoid disability, but he feels safe. The narcissist doesn't have even this. He resents the schizoid core, the schizoid nucleus, the absence, the emptiness inside himself. He resents it, and it doesn't make him feel safe. On the very contrary, it makes him feel like he is disappearing. Mortification is the sensation of vanishing, evaporating into molecules. Like narcissism, paranoia and depression are also defenses against the schizoid state. If external object relations are too threatening, if contact with other people is hurtful or potentially hurtful, and if there is zero tolerance for pain and hurt, there's hurt, aversion, pain, aversion, because the, the, inner, the inner structures are fragmented, they're dysregulated, they're labile, there are numerous self-states, the whole thing is a precarious house of cards, which is going to disintegrate, the whole edifice is going to crumble under the slightest pressure from an external object. So paranoia and depression are defenses against the schizoid state. The schizoid state is a defense against external object relations. So we have a defense against a defense. If external object relations are too threatening, you could choose to not have external object relations at all. That's, of course, possibly the psychotic state. But there are compromises. 
Narcissism is one such compromise. Paranoia and depression is another such compromise. It's the next best thing. You can't have external object relations, but you can have internal object relations. In schizoid state, there's no ego. There's no object re external object relations at all. In the paranoid, depressive, narcissistic states, there, there is object relations. There is object relations with external objects, but they are internalized. They are converted into an, an internal objects in order to maintain full control, avoid abandonment, avoid persecution in the case of the paranoid, or avoid guilt in the case of the depressive, to avoid negative emotionality. So let's sum it up. A child who has been exposed to a bad, dead mother, bad, dead father, bad caregivers, a child who did not experience as a baby and a toddler, did not experience proper, happy, loving object relations with external objects. Such a child would be terrified of having anything to do with other people or with the world. So such a child has several solutions available to him. Number one, such a child can become schizoid. He can cut off the world. He can disengage from all humanity. He can lock himself, withdraw, abandon everything and everyone. And this is actually to choose death, to, to become the undead, to become zombified, to go back to the womb, to be unborn. Solution number one. Solution number two. He can become a narcissist. He can become a paranoid. He can become depressive. These three solutions, what they have in common is that object relations is maintained. There is the inner schizoid core. There is the inner emptiness. There is the absence. The person has been unborn. The person went back to the womb, is undead, is a zombie, but desperately tries to cling to the vestiges and remnants of a world. Desperately wants to be in touch with another human being, wants to feel loved, wants to experience intimacy somehow, even if it's a mild, uh, pale version of the original, a pale imitation. So be it. He wants it desperately. So he rejects the total schizoid solution. And narcissism, paranoia and depression is when the, you, the, the narcissist creates a false self allows people to interact with the false self, to love the false self, to be intimate with the false self, to adulate the false self, everything with the false self, not with the narcissist. And then internalizes these external objects who are interacting with the false self, internalizes them so that he can maintain full control over them, so that they don't betray him, they don't persecute him, they don't accuse him of anything. They don't cheat on him. They don't. It's by internalizing the external object, the narcissist makes sure that this in, this object, who used to be external and now is internal, will never abandon him, never betray him, never stab him in the back, never persecute him, n will never hurt him, will never cause him pain, pain that he cannot tolerate, mortification. So. These are the two mechanisms, and they are common in paranoia, and they are common, common in depression as well. Internal objects can be persecutory. For example, the inner critic or the sadistic superego. But the narcissist experiences these uh, persec persecutory objects as ex external. Remember, the narcissist confuses internal with external. He internalizes external objects. He internalizes you, for example, but he still experiences you as an external object. Though you had become an internal object, though he is interacting exclusively with the internal object, his experience of this is internal object is wrong, erroneous. He believes this internal object to be external. Now, 
this cre if if the object is persecutory it creates paranoia because even though it's an internal object that is persecutory it is projected it's experienced as external and this creates paranoia and paranoia creates aggression defensive aggression similar with with love with emotions the narcissist internalizes you supposed supposing you are his intimate partner supposing he's attracted to you infatuated with you wants you wants you in his shared fantasy so first of all he directs you to the false self he redirects you to the false self that's a decoy that's a protection that's a firewall that's a shield no pain no hurt one two he internalizes you he takes a snapshot internalizes you and from that moment on he continues to interact with the internal object but he experiences you as external he mistakes the internal object for an external object and gradually you can become a persecutory object in which case he will develop paranoia and he will seek to destroy you this will provoke aggression which will be directed at you even though it was the internal object that had generated the persecution he will punish you because he mistakes the internal object for you and mistakes you for the internal object he doesn't realize he has an internal object he thinks it's you and when the internal object engages in any dynamic he attributes this dynamic to you he projects it onto you if he's persecuted by the internal object he says you are persecuting me if he's accused by an internal object if he feels guilty because he's accused by an accusatory internal object he says you're accusing me he attributes it to you he says you're criticizing me all the time you're accusing me all the time if he is loved by an internal object he similarly would attribute it to you if he's idealized by an internal object he would also say you're idealizing whatever the internal object does within the narcissist because he mistakes it for you he will attribute to you via a process of projection the schizoid chooses the safety of withdrawing of avoiding reality of denying external access to external objects uh, but the schizoid also has no access to internal objects for example the internal object representing his mother and his only solution is what Guntry and Fairburn and others called identification identification and the other solution is incorporation in other words schizoids because they don't have access to external objects they cut all external object relations off they are not in touch with people they are solitary they are lone wolves okay they also don't have access to internal objects so what they try to do they try to merge they try to fuse they try to assimilate they try to disappear they, they already disappeared their absence their emptiness so they try to integrate to become one with an existing object they are an absence in search of a presence non-entity in search of an entity um, and this is going back to the womb going back to the womb for example is assimilating the external object that is mother and the internal object that is mother which are inaccessible by going back to the womb the schizoid becomes one with these objects again and going back to the womb is of course an allegory a metaphor by withdrawing into confined spaces and this is the core function of the pathological narcissistic space all confined spaces where the narcissist and the schizoid feel safe they are womb substitutes we'll come in a minute to the codependent and the borderline because they choose an identical solution merger fusion assimilation going back to the womb the narcissist chooses the pleasure not the safety but the pleasure of approach uh, because approach allow the, allows him to master external objects via grandiosity via exploitive entitlement and via 
internalization. So the schizoid chooses to, because he has no access to objects, internal or external, he chooses to become the object. If you have no access to objects, the next best strategy is to become the object. Because anyhow, you don't exist. You have nothing to lose. You want to become the object. So the schizoid wants to become his mother by going back to the womb. The borderline and the codependent want to become the intimate partner. Merger and fusion in codependency, borderline, in schizoid states, assimilation, they are all second best solutions. I can't have access to external objects because I'm terrified of what may happen. I'm afraid of the pain, abandonment. I'm afraid of abandonment in borderline personality disorders. I don't want external objects. I don't want external objects. No, thank you. I don't have access to internal objects because my everything there is disorganized, discombobulated, chaotic, fragmented. I don't have proper access to internal objects. So what I'm, I will do instead, I will merge with an object. I will fuse with an object. I will become an object, another object. I will become my intimate partner. I will become my mother. And that way, I will get to live. I will get to survive. And I will get to experience reality and even object relations safely, simply by vanishing and reappearing, born again. The narcissist is reborn, born again, as the grandiose false self. The borderline, the schizoid, the codependent are reborn, born again, via the agency of another person, usually an intimate partner. Frequently, an intimate partner that stands in for a parental, parental figure, mother or father. All these solutions are regressive, of course. They are all infantile. They're all a child's solutions. But these people never grow up. All these people, narcissists, schizoids, borderlines, codependents, they never grow up. These are children coping with adult issues with children's tools and instruments, with a children, child's capacity of comprehension, with a child's insights, almost non-existent. So when you see these solutions, they are, of course, infantile and regressive. They are a child's solution. Codependency and borderlines, exactly like the narcissist, they are composites. Remember, the narcissist solution is, I'm going to be schizoid, I'm going to disappear, I'm going to become an absence. But before I do that, I'm going to create a false self. And via the false self, by proxy, vicariously, secondhand, I'm going to experience reality, the world, and I'm going to experience external object relations. Borderlines and, and codependence have a similar compromise, a similar composite solution. Merger and fusion are actually a compromise. They are a composite solution because they allow the borderline and the codependent to feel both safe and pleasurable. They provide pleasure and they prov provide safety. And this is accomplished via pseudo-psychosis. That's why Kernberg said that borderlines are borderline. They're on the border with psychosis. In codependency, as well as in borderline, there's pseudo-psychosis. Because they do exactly the opposite of the narcissist. You see, all these three, actually all these five, the narcissist, the paranoid, the depressive, depressive the borderline, the codependent, all five were faced with a grave life endangering threat, the schizoid state. All of them faced the possibility, the distinct possibility of self-inflicted extinction. Terrified, they all chose different solutions. The narcissist solution was to internalize external objects and thereby control them. That's a solution. What you, can, what you control cannot hurt you. The borderline codependent chose exactly the opposite solution. They externalize internal objects. The mother's womb that the schizoid, schizoid want to go back, wants to go back to, 
the codependent and borderline externalize the mother and her womb. They externalize internal objects and they mistake external objects for internal objects, exactly like the narcissist. So it gives them a sense of safety and a sense of security and pleasure because they are inflationary. What the narcissist does, he takes the world and swallows it like Kronos, you know, in the in Greek mythology. He swallows external objects and they become internal and he feels safe and he has the pleasure of interacting with external objects via the false self. The borderline and codependent expand themselves like the Big Bang. They go out. This is called hyperreflexivity. It's common in psychotic disorders as well. They externalize internal objects and then they get confused. They think that their internal objects are actually external, exactly like the narcissist. So one of them swallows and assimilates the world. One of them is assimilated in the world. One of them renders everything external internal. That's the narcissist. And the borderline and codependent render everything internal external. They kind of disintegrate, evaporate, and become one with the world. It's not the world, it's the intimate partner. So the borderline and codependent solution is, I'm going to disappear and reappear in my intimate partner's mind and body. I'm going to merge with my intimate partner. I'm going to fuse with my intimate partner. It's all very religious because there's a process of dying and resurrection. And this is probably the power of the biblical, biblical narrative. Because dying and resurrection are the core principles of mental illness, the, at least in cluster B personality disorder but I think in many other situations like paranoia and depression. So, uh, attempting to cope with an impossible, threatening environment, people, children come up with solutions that involve dying in one way to gratify the parent because the parent is rejecting. The parent's message is, I want you dead. I want you to die. You're a nuisance. You're, I don't know what, you're disappointing. You're frustrated. I don't want you. I don't love you. I want you to die. So the child says, okay, mommy, I will die. I become schizoid. But I don't want to die. I want to be in touch with the world. I want to be in touch with... So they come up with these composite solutions, with these compromises. And they become the world, or the world becomes them, and they confuse external and internal, all in desperate attempts. Desperate attempts to maintain hold on reality and interact with other people. And in this sense, being abandoned, abandonment, is the equivalent of birth. Otto Rank suggested the concept of traumatic birth. And in the minds of these personalities, narcissistic, borderline codependent, being abandoned is the equivalent of being born. But they don't want to be born. They want to be dead. They want to be the undead. They want to be dead, but in touch. So the borderline is dead inside. The codependent is dead inside. But their solution is, I will accept that I'm dead inside, but I will live. I will live outside. And how will I do that? I will disappear and reappear, resurrect, be reborn as my intimate partner. The narcissist solution is, I'm dead inside. I accept it. It's painful, but I accept it. I'm going to reappear. I'm going to resurrect as the false self. That way I'll be in touch with, with reality. But being abandoned, when these people are abandoned, the solution falls apart. And it's like they went back to the womb. They did. They went back to the womb. And now they have to exit again. They have to be born. They have to be, they're forced into the world and into external object relations not mediated via the solutions on compromises that they had come up with as children. This is the process of modification. 
Abandonment causes mortification by eliminating the false self, by eliminating the persecutory object in paranoia, by eliminating the accusatory object in, in, in uh, depression, by eliminating functional internal objects and replacing them with the same thing from recognizable external objects. So the, in the case of the depressive, the accusations come from a real life person, not from his inner object. In the case of a paranoid, he's really persecuted by a real person, conspired against, malice. In the case of the narcissist, he suffers narcissistic injury and humiliation at the hand of a real life person. So abandonment is when these defenses are shattered in a process called this decompensation. All the defenses shut down and all the internal objects are demolished because they critically depend on the operation of these defenses. They are either demolished or inactivated. At that moment, the narcissist, for example, cannot operate any grandiose defense. His false self is shut off, you know, so he has no grandiose defenses. He's not godlike anymore. Is a mere mortal, vulnerable, fragile. So the narcissist has no grandiose defenses and can no longer control, manipulate his internal objects because they are equally shut off or even destroyed. So he's absolutely back to the first months of life or the first two years of life when he had been terrified by a rejecting hateful dead mother because at that time before he had come up with a narcissistic schizoid solution during these years before he, he, he had invented the false self it was raw terror raw horror an abandonment or any other crisis like being cheated on or bankruptcy or divorce or what they do they disable the defenses and they deactivate or destroy the internal objects at that second the narcissist feels that his world is spinning out of control external objects are no longer internal they cause him pain and he cannot master them tell them what to do control them and he falls he falls apart this extreme anxiety, decompensation, acting out. And in many cases, there is a self-state, the protector self-state, usually a secondary or primary psychopath, psychopathic self-state. And this self-state comes forward. Comes forward, for example, the borderline. When the borderline is subjected to rejection, abandonment, humiliation, real, imagined, or anticipated, the borderline brings forward a self-state, a psychopathic self-state. It's a secondary psychopath. It's a psychopath with access to empathy and emotions, but it's still a psychopath. It's impulsive, reckless, etc. Disempathic. Um, so empathy is suspended. So the protector self-state takes over in such a case in order to avoid mortification, but it usually doesn't work, actually. Mortification is only minimally delayed. A major object relations crisis major crisis with an external object such as abandonment cheating and so on is bound to bring mortification so what are you there for what's your role as the narcissist's intimate partner you are there to facilitate this solution the narcissistic solution you are there to serve as the narcissist's womb as his mother's womb you are the womb. I want you to understand how critical, supremely critical, your role is. Now, the narcissist would deny this because he is a schizoid, remember. At core, the core of the narcissist, the non-existent core, is absence, schizoid absence. So if you interrogate the narcissist, he would tell you she's interchangeable, she's dispensable, she's disposable. She's like a bus. They come and go every 10 minutes. But really, 
your function, your role in the narcissist's life is regulatory and life-sustaining. Let me put it this way. If you mortify the narcissist, this is the closest that he comes to suicide because he becomes effectively a borderline. Dysregulated emotions and everything. All these defenses crumble. And we know that when these defenses crumble, narcissists develop borderline traits, as do victims of complex trauma, by the way. So you are there in the narcissist's life within his shared fantasy. Shared fantasy is a controlled space because the narcissist can't take chances with you. He can't have you improvising. He can't rely on your goodwill, judgment, uh, uh, moods, effects, cognition. No, no way. He's not going to trust you with anything, ever. He's going to take you by the hand. He's going to convert you into an internal object. And he's going to embed you firmly in the ground of the shared fantasy. That way, he feels safe. But within the shared fantasy, your main function is to be his, the womb of his mother. The place where he can go to when he is in the schizoid state. You are the womb. You are the fount and source of the oceanic feeling of safety that he experiences when he is with you. Never mind how much he abuses you. Never mind how much he fights with you. Never mind how much he says he hates you and he does. Still, you are the womb. You are the safest most holding, unconditionally accepting place where he can shed some of his narcissistic defenses and indulge in or experience fearlessly the schizoid state. You have another function, of course, secondary narcissistic supply. Your function is to affirm the reality and the veracity of the false self. You you tell the narcissist the false self is not false. It's true. It's real. So you have two functions. The most important one, you are the safe zone. You're beyond the comfort zone. You're a safe zone. It's to you that he goes when he needs, he needs to let go and become a schizoid. You are his schizoid sanctuary. And the second thing is, you uphold and buttress and support his grandiose false self, because it's the only way that he can have any relationship with you. You're an external object. He has relationships with external objects only via the false self. It's not safe to have a relationship directly with you. It needs to be mediated, filtered, firewalled, evaluated, assessed, accessed, reframed, whatever, via the false self and its grandiose uh, fantasies. Remember that the narcissist misperceives you as an external object when actually he had internalized you already. In order to guarantee your functioning, in order to control you, manipulate you, prevent abandonment, the first thing the narcissist did was snapshot you, took a snapshot of you and internalized you. But he mistakes you for an ex external object. There's a confusion in his mind. He thinks you're external when actually he's interacting exclusively with your representation in his mind. But because you're external in his mind, because you're external in his mind, wrongly, you have the power to tell him, you have the power to report to him about reality. You are, in other words, the narcissist reality testing. You're the gauge. He refers to you for reality testing. And the most critical question in his mind, am I nuts? Am I insane? Is the false self real? And you are there to say, yes, dear, it is real. You are a genius. You are amazing. You um, sort of accumulate, you record past narcissistic glories and recount them to him. Sick transit. Um, Narcissus Mundi. Sic transit Gloria Narcissi. Put it this way. So, you are... Look how many critical functions you have. 
you are his safe refuge and sanctuary where he can be himself where he can be where he can be a non entity where he can be an absence himself means no self because he has no ego where he can vanish knowing full well that he will rematerialize it's like teleportation you are the teleportation cha chamber you are the one who confirms to him and assures him that the false self is not false but real you are his reality testing nothing is more important you are the mother you are the mother in this sense you are the womb the narcissist internalizes all external objects they said so so if we take this principle you begin to understand that your existence in the narcissist's mind is very very bizarre and peculiar take for example the famous madonna whore complex the madonna whore complex is not a splitting defense directed at external objects because narcissists don't interact with external objects they internalize them they interact only with internal objects so it is meaningless to say that the narcissist regards some women as madonnas and some women as whores it's meaningless because it does not regard women end of story he regards representations of women he interacts with internal objects that stands for women but these internal objects have very little to do with you they go through a process of idealization and it's a mess it's not you so what is the madonna whore complex it's an internal splitting not external splitting because there's no external object relations with the narcissist there's no contact with external objects so it must be an internal splitting as Gantrip had observed the self is split the non-existent self i mean it's difficult to wrap your hand your head around this the processes the psychodynamic processes they are split the narcissist splits himself to all body and all mind all mental similar reminiscent of somatic and cerebral yes so all body and all mental the all body part interacts with whorish women it doesn't have anything to do with judging these women it's not that the narcissist says, well i'm going to look for whorish women it's that his body part interacts with women who are classified as whorish internal objects and his mind part interacts with women who are classified as madonna internal objects they're both internal objects the narcissist is auto-erotic he has sex he loves he's libidin libidinally invested he's emotionally cathected all the processes are auto-directed self-directed so he cannot have anything to do with women even during sex but he splits himself internal splitting that's an example of how bizarre the narcissist world is now you i said that earlier i said that uh, you're a fetish uh, to remind you the sexual fetish is uh originally the, the fetish is um, was when the savage saw something as the embodiment of his god so it could be an object and the savage said well god is in this object and that's a fetish Freud discusses this in three contributions to the theory of sex 1905 so when you have a propensity to regard or treat other people caregivers parents intimate partners as objects to objectify them that's fetishism when the narcissist converts you objectifies you into an internal object he's fetishizing you he's treating you as a fetish now fetishism is an inevitable phase of personal development and growth during the formative years six uh, six months to three years psychoanalysis and object relations theories teach us that we outgrow the fetishistic immature way of relating to external objects to the human environment and instead 
what is what replaces fetishism is empathy when we perceive others as human beings full-fledged human beings not objects and yet some people narcissists for example but not only narcissists i mentioned paranoids i mentioned borderlines i mentioned codependence they're all the same these people remain fixated in the fetishistic, fetishistic phase they do not progress into full-fledged adulthood and arguably the most ostentatious manifestation of this retardation is sexual there's a paraphilia called fetishism but there is mental or psychological fetishism and it is equally rampant and equally egregious in sexual fetishism there are three types of fetishes inanimate object body part or reified trait so classic fetishes sexual fetishes react to a specific object or a specific body part or a specific trait or quality of a person the narcissist is exactly the same he transforms you into an object and then he reacts to your traits to your body parts anyone who has ever had sex with a narcissist will note the narcissist's inordinate focus on specific body parts you know feet breasts the narcissist reduces his intimate partner his female intimate partner or, or his intimate partner into an assemblage of organs assemblage of body parts and then he chooses some of these body parts as erotic erogenous um, zones and he is aroused by these body parts actually not by the totality in this sense he's a fetishist that is of course sexual fetishism we have objective fetishes these are fetish people who fetishize objects we have somatic fetishes who fetishize body parts and we have abstract fetishes who fetishize a personality trait or a body trait the same with psychological fetishes the narcissist fetishizes your body parts fetishizes you as an object and fetishizes certain traits this process of fetishizing the traits is what is called idealization it's when you convert when you invest emotionally and according to freud and many others right there's no difference between emotional energy and sexual energy when you invest emotionally in a specific set of traits this is idealization when you elevate them emotionally to a privileged position that's idealization so people who prefer autoerotic auto partialist uh, anonymous sex they are also fetishes with the fetish being their own bodies or the organs of their sex partners so the narcissist behaves this way in sex he's focused on his gratification his body he uses your body parts he masturbates with your body in effect but also outside the bedroom he uses you for gratification he reduces you he reduces you to a set of traits one two three traits four traits and you are these traits and he can do this because he is not interacting with you he's interacting with an internal object and he can design and redesign this internal object as he sees fit he's in total control so this this is a pathologic pathological attachment to a fetish but this is an internalized fetish because the narcissist is autoerotic even his fetishism is directed inwards not outwards normal fetishes direct their arousal their sex drive outwards uh, narcissistic fetishes direct everything inwards so they're going to fetishize an internal object and the idealized traits of this internal object and it's going to carry over to the sex as well and so um, in the absence of the fetish most fetishes are sexually dysfunctional same with the narcissist in the absence of the fetishized idealized internal object he becomes dysfunctional and the circumstances surrounding the fetishistic sexual encounter are not very material and similarly 
anyone can serve as an intimate partner or a source of supply. It's a kind of tunnel vision. It's very similar to the to autism spectrum disorder, schizophrenic or somatoform disorders. It indicates an underlying mental health problem or trauma or process. Okay, the, the narcissist fetishizes you, he internalizes you, he reduces you to a set of traits and so on, and then he uses you. He uses you to uphold his false self, to establish reality testing and to become the safe zone where he can be him, himself, him, him non-self, a schizoid. And this is actually your role. When you abandon the narcissist or threaten to abandon him, and when you cheat on him, when you betray him as he sees it and so on, everything falls apart and he is mortified. Same process in borderline, same process in codependency. We can ask, okay, if it's the same process in all three, aren't, they, aren't these three one and the same? No, of course not. There are massive differences. I suggest that you watch relevant videos. But this particular process, these defenses against the schizoid state exist in all three disorders. But remember, the narcissist solution is the exact opposite, the diametrical opposite to the borderline codependent solution. All three fetishize the intimate partner. All three idealize the intimate partner. But the narcissist chooses to assimilate her, to swallow her, to convert her into an internal object. And the borderline and codependent want the intimate partner to do it to them. They want to become an internal object in the intimate, inside the intimate partner. They want to go back to the womb, but to a specific womb, a functional womb, a womb which will provide external object relations. The narcissist wants to go back to the womb, but again, a specific womb, a womb that will uphold his view of himself, the false self, the grandiosity. So they all want to go back to the womb because they are driven by the schizoid engine. They're driven by the schizoid core, but they resist this drive. They, they, they strike a compromise with the schizoid state. They say, please, we will, we, will, we will become absent. We will disappear. We promise. We will, we will, not, be, we will not exist anymore. But please let us experience objects, relationships with, with objects, with other people. Please. And we will do it in a way that will satisfy you because we will disappear in the process of having a relationship with an external object. We will disappear by becoming the false self. We will disappear by merging and fusing with an intimate partner and we will disappear by developing extreme dependence on an intimate partner. The disappearing act is the schizoid part. It's the sacrifice, the human sacrifice to the schizoid god, schizoid idol. The What's left are the dysfunctional solutions that these children had found in desperate attempts to not disappear to somehow remain rooted or planted in reality, to keep one, one foot in reality, to somehow, somewhere, with someone, have a fleeting, ephemeral touch of contact, like a butterfly, simulated external relations, relationships. These people crave, crave intimacy and love crave other people. They just can't. They feel threatened. And they, ha they had become schizoids early on. And the borderline veneer, the codependency veneer, the narcissism um, veneer, these are all camouflages. They're all compromises struck with the schizoid core, allowing the person, the non-person, the non-entity, to pretend in a make-believe world that she or he is in touch with other people, is loved, is held, knowing deep inside that it's a doomed effort. A doomed effort, because ultimately the schizoid wins. All narcissists end life 
all narcissists in life alone, decomposing, decaying, ruminating and brooding on past glories, pathetically trying to recapture them and recreate them. All narcissists, all borderlines, all codependents end up losing the battle and becoming full-fledged schizoids.